a bipartisan vote of over 300 members of Congress ousting him. It includes about half, about 47 percent, of current Republican members of Congress who came to view Santos as just too costly. I have been convicted of no crimes, Mr. Speaker. He has manufactured his entire life. He blatantly stole from his campaign. Mr. Santos used tragic events in history to try and propel himself to public office. He can defend himself in a court of law, but for the purposes of this body, he's got to go. Got to go, and he went. Today's vote also narrows these House Republicans' slim majority. They can now only use, only lose three votes from their Republican caucus. And the nation saw how that kind of very narrow margin can strengthen the hand of hardline defectors. That's what helped Matt Gates. There were so few votes to be lost that he could get a couple of people and hold leverage over the speaker, or as we all remember, change the speaker. And that is also one of the raw pieces of political math that formed the reason why Republicans were holding back on this move they finally made today. But George Santos's lies and misconduct and now alleged crimes snowballed into something that the Republican Party clearly wanted to publicly break away from before this coming election next November. That's when Santos was, of course, already slated to leave Congress anyway. Santos confessed he had never worked directly for Goldman Sachs and Citigroup. What was going on inside you? Look, Greg, here's the deal. I would have never gotten the nomination from Nassau County GOP if I had not concluded college. A Republican congressman is now accused of scamming a disabled veteran who was trying to raise money for his dying dog's cancer treatment. Saying on his campaign website that his mother was Jewish and his grandparents escaped the Nazis during World War II. I never claimed to be Jewish, Santos said. I said I was Jew-ish. In a tweet last year, Santos said 9-11 claimed my mother's life. Immigration records obtained by NBC News show that Santos's mother was not even in the U.S. when 9-11 happened. I've been a terrible liar on, okay. the, on those subjects. This, this wasn't about tricking anybody. It is a lot. And the House Ethics Committee report added details and evidence that gave other members of Congress the argument that at least some fair and full process was used here. And that would be a contrast to the first attempt to expel Santos, which we should remind you tonight as we follow this news. The first attempt failed. That came before the Ex Ethics Committee finished its work. Now, even if you put George Santos and everything you just heard to refresh your memory, put that to the side for a moment. Let's be clear. There can be hard governing questions about how Congress chooses to override the voters' will to completely boot members. A fair factual process matters, and history has not always redeemed some of Congress's approach here, like how the House actually targeted the first ever black committee chair, Adam Clayton Powell, in a related legislative plot to exclude, that was the word they used, rather than expel that member. Now, if you want to Look that up or remember it, I'll, I'll tell you tonight. The Supreme Court ultimately reversed that move seven to one. And the lesson is not, I don't think, that Congress can never have a standard for booting members, but that there must be facts, due process, and a pretty high bar. You turn that back to Santos, the now former congressman, is actually the first member expelled in two decades, and the first whose conduct was deemed by his colleagues so extreme that he was expelled without either a criminal conviction or literally taking up arms against the U.S. Here's how the New York Times reports that tonight. This move today consigned Santos to a genuine place in history, the first person to be expelled from the House without first being convicted of a federal crime or supporting the Confederacy. Three House members who have been expelled before Santos were, for example, slave-owning Confederacy supporters at a time where that was no longer deemed acceptable in the United States Congress. Now, for his part, I should take care to also mention that Mr. Santos is still legally presumed innocent on the criminal cases. He faces 23 felony counts related to fraud and misconduct. He proclaims his innocence, and there will be a trial that's scheduled for next year. So, breathe in, breathe out. That is the news, a little bit of the history, and that already is a lot. 
Today, Congress did draw a line, and it did so with many people in both parties standing up to these lies in government. So that's a major and unusual storyline. But I want to tell you tonight, and I want to take a little more time to walk through this because it matters, there's actually more here than just that. If tonight marks a stand against government lies and the damage they can do, most of the House Republicans taking this rare, strong measure against these lies also are failing to bring that standard to the big lie, to the way Donald Trump abused power to deceive millions about his election loss, a lie that fed an insurrection. And I want to be very clear about this. This is not some freewheeling, broad effort to tie these things together. We are talking about lies in government and whether there's accountability and what Republicans say they did today and what they're actually doing. And as a matter of news standards, we do not need to say Trump's lie allegedly fed the insurrection. We can report for you it is a fact that it did so. It is a fact that Trump lost the election. It is a fact that his lies and his demand that his fans come to Washington to act on those lies fed the crowd, populated the crowd, which then stormed the Capitol and committed what is now legally a convicted sedition that day. That's a reality and a legal fact. Now, whether Donald Trump himself as a defendant is ultimately convicted is a separate and open question. But to be clear, just as Santos has not yet been convicted, the lie part of that equation is not an open question. And if anyone knows how it went down, it is those members of Congress, including the Republicans who were giving speeches, they said, against lies today. They were standing on the very floor that those Trump fans and now convicted seditionists, some of them, stormed and ransacked because of the power of lies. And I say this quite literally, and I want to spell it out quite precisely. That day was not billed as some sore loser party. It was not sold that way. And that's not what those now convicted seditionists mostly said or thought. And we know that even beyond propaganda from their private texts and messages with each other. It was a response to Donald Trump's lies about, quote, stopping the steal. Lies from a far more powerful member of government than George Santos about much more important matters than Mr. Santos's job history or Botox or really the rest of the stuff that we no longer have to cover that much in the news. There was danger posed to Congress. There was an attack on American democracy itself. So keep that in mind and the Republicans' ongoing support for that lie and the way they voted against the certification at the time and sided with Trump after and continue to do so today as he is their main candidate to go back into the White House. Keep that all in mind as you make sense of this story tonight, because as I said, it is rare and it is a big deal, but also keep it in mind as you listen to what is about half the Republican caucus and some of the others who criticized Santos and maybe didn't vote against him as they claim outrage over government lies. He defrauded the voters of his district. He, his life was made up. It was a lie. I think the, the right decision was reached today. That this is by far uh, the worst corruption that we've seen where an, an individual member has not chosen to resign. George Santos should have resigned, and actually any other person in his situation likely would have. Any other person should resign. Well, forget resign. How about unapologetically run for the highest office in the land while vowing pardons and sweetheart deals for people now convicted of sedition against the United States government. It doesn't take a lot of mental work here to sub out Santos, a relatively obscure, new, now former congressman, and the person they are actually trying to put in charge of the country and your life and your vote and maybe the future of our democracy. Defendant Trump faces criminal evidence on more serious charges than Santos. That's a fact. As for the examples here with the Republicans, take Congressman Max Miller, who as a staffer helped plan the January 6th rally, who backed Trump post-coup, and then wants to tell his district, perhaps people concerned about this going into the election, that he stands against lies and fraud if they're by George Santos. I myself have been a victim of George Santos and as well as other members of Congress in terms of defrauding through public donations. I'm running for Congress to stand up for what is right for the people of Northeast Ohio. They have made their values clear at the ballot box. Their congressman betrayed them anyway. I'm Max Miller, and I will never betray our voters. That's why President Trump endorsed me. 
I refuse to let him down. I want to take two more examples. These are Republicans who took the rare step to oust Santos, they said again, over the lies and fraud, while actively backing Donald Trump's lies, which fed the attack on their very workplace and safety, among other things, on Jan 6. I talked to one of the Capitol Police. They told me a lot of people were just milling around. <laughs> Now, we just went through some of the details, the history, even the nuance about what it takes for Congress to disqualify people. But this is more than just a story about the now former Congressman George Santos or whatever happens to him. Because it got so bad, politically, publicly, and otherwise, that even this Republican MAGA party had to come in and say, we stand against these lies. And they're, I guess, hoping that nobody will look around at the other obvious cloud of the big lie hanging all over all of this. And we live in a time where we are told maybe nothing matters and nobody's paying attention and everyone's fatigued, but if that were true, they wouldn't have to do this. They would just move on and roll into the next year. They wanted to get this done. They didn't want to just let him go off quietly. He said he wasn't running against anyway. And that's a reminder that actually the facts matter that reporting and public pressure and information matters, that there's some quantum of voters that these Republicans care about. Again, these are Republicans, 47% of them that did this anti-lie vote today. And yet they are now stuck going into an election year with their big lie candidate. So I put it a lot of different ways with some nuance, but to end it as simply as possible, it is a tough day for a lot of MAGA Republicans because their position literally boils down to small lie bad. Big lie, good. There is a lot going on, but the DA in Georgia has been on a roll, a 4-0 record in converting defendants into convicts in that Trump RICO case. Well, today, we got some dramatic arguments there because Trump's lawyers were actually appearing in this packed courtroom for the first time. And they are trying to make their defense as they watch others turn and flip on Trump. They argue that because he was talking and using free speech in their view when he claimed there was voter fraud and tried to overturn the election, that somehow he should not be subject to the RICO laws of the state of Georgia. So what you're seeing here is new. These are Trump's lawyers in the Georgia RICO, RICO courtroom for the first time. And they want the whole thing thrown out. Indeed, they argue, and they have every right to make their defenses, that this is now not a RICO case, but more like, quote, election interference. Can you imagine the notion of the Republican nominee for president not being able to campaign for the presidency because he is in some form or fashion in a courtroom defending himself, that would be the most effective election interference for the history of the United States. That's the argument. Trump's lawyer basically saying that what Donald Trump has argued, that this is somehow a persecution or a political process, that should mean he's not subject to election laws. In this case, the election racketeering conspiracy that he's accused of, that he shouldn't even have to defend himself in court. The prosecution pushed back. This trial does not constitute election interference. Let's be clear. Our, th this is not election interference. This is moving forward with the, the, the business of Fulton County. Um, I don't think that it in any way impedes uh, Defendant Trump's ability to, to campaign or do whatever he needs to do in order to seek office. Likewise, the prosecution dealt with those free speech defenses. You know, we heard from the other side these grand statements about this is a prosecution of political speech, this is a prosecution of expression, this is a prosecution of association, petition, etc. That is not true. And the indictment tells you so. This is a prosecution for violating the Georgia RICO Act, individuals conspiring to participate in a pattern of racketeering activity while associated with a criminal enterprise. It's a prosecution for solicitation of violation of both of office, false statements and writings, impersonating public officers, and the list goes on and on. That's what it sounds like, but what does it mean? Well, we turn to former federal prosecutor John Flannery, who's with me here in Washington. Good to see you, sir. Good to see you. Um, at times it sounds dry, and that's what these kind of pretrial hearings can be. Right. And yet, 
they're talking about very big stuff, including whether or not there will be a RICO case against Trump. What, what stood out to you about what we just heard? Well, what stood out is that if you don't have a standard by which to compare what they're saying, then you don't understand what they're doing to us, mm. which is there is few of us, if it were stated this way, even by the prosecution, that I'm sorry, but, you know, inciting a riot, that's not petitioning your government. Yeah. Uh, interfering with a government proceeding, that's not. Uh, so, so it's the thing about it's speech plus and it's speech plus bad acts. And it's not just saying, oh, I think we're doing something wrong here. And then the, the irony that the prosecution maybe feels constrained that they can't say is to say he has some nerve coming into this courtroom and talking about us interfering in an election when he interfered in an election. And his biggest campaign promise is his lie that they stole the election. Well, you know what they call that in the in the deep south? They call that chutzpah. <laughs> chutzpah, yes, yeah, I know. Chutzpah. That's what it's called. I, but I, I, I want to build on in Manhattan than I hear it in the Deep South. I want to build on that because because we also excerpted another part of this. I want to play right now for the first time today. Sure. This all went down today where, yeah. as you refer to it, the Trump lawyers say, oh, it's unprecedented. And guess what? It is true that some of this is unprecedented. The question is, which way does that cut? Here was the prosecutor punching back on that point. OK. We heard from the other side that this is the first time a prosecution of this type has been brought, that it's unprecedented. And that may be true, but this is the first time someone has, a criminal enterprise has gotten together and tried to overturn the results of an election. So I don't think that's a particularly persuasive argument. What is the prosecutor trying to get the judge to see there? Because the judge is supposed to be fair, not right. pick sides. Right. The judge hears, oh, this is really unprecedented. True. And right. then the prosecutor is trying to do what? Well, I, see, I think I think he shaves points. In other words, that was strong. That was stronger than the earlier clip that we saw. But the strength that he's missing is to say, uh, well, uh, it's unprecedented because there has been no one in the history of America that would do such crimes against the government, betray their oath of office, and think that an autocracy should replace a democracy. I think you can say those things. And also, since the uh, Trump and his uh, minions <laughs> are abusing the system, I think that you could you could say in that context that uh, this is unprecedented and therefore we have a burden to deal with it. And we have to deal with it in the courtroom and out of it because these frivolous arguments they make today, they're not for you, Your Honor. They're for the team outside. This is one campaign. They're prepared to accept the conviction. I think they should say things like that. It's truth. Uh, they're prepared to accept the con conviction because this is part of their campaign to make you the enemy of the Trump campaign and everybody else who's on the court or a witness or a clerk to a judge in New York. The other thing here is the calendar that hangs over all of this. Yes. Uh, we're talking going into the holidays. Right. Mid-January, you have the presidential primaries. Right. Uh, we have the prospect of a, of a candidate here who could be convicted and run. He also could ultimately beat the cases. We don't right. prejudge that. Yes. Um, I thought that the Trump lawyers made a valid legal point in saying that if Donald Trump whatever happens, were to become president again, which right. is possible, as you know, John, then this state case, right. unlike perhaps some other ones, probably would have to sit in the back uh, because we do have a supremacy clause in the Constitution. I don't know if you have a roundabout way to punch back, but this is Mr. Sato, the Trump <laughs> lawyer, and he basically says, look, we don't live in a country where 50 states can constantly uh, try or jail the right. sitting president were he to become that again. Take a listen. Okay. If your client does uh, win election in 2024, uh, could he even be tried in 2025? The answer to that is, I believe that uh, the supremacy clause and his duty to the President of the United States, this trial would not take place at all until after he left the term of office. He put it, I just want to, I know, I see you're gearing up. He put it precisely. He didn't say no trial ever. Right. He said what we were told when the last time this came up, when Donald Trump was president, which is a state case would have to wait till he leaves office. No? No. Uh, and I know you're just stating their position. It's not something you necessarily believe, because I, I can't believe that you would believe that. Because? I'm sorry, I'm just teasing you. No, because, I know, but, but. Because the, the reason is this. Uh, you may remember Vice President Agnew. He was prosecuted while he was the vice president. He entered a plea of guilty and resigned from office. I hate to lawyer you, but in a federal case. Well, but the point, the point is the same. 
The same in this sense. He was prosecuted while in office.